Hello and good evening all. As mentioned in Wednesday's re-record of the Corvette DP video, tonight we're deep diving the history and evolution of the Daytona prototype class as it existed from 2003 till its replacement with Daytona Prototype International in 2017. This video is very audio heavy, but rather image light, owing to a combination of IMSA's and YouTube's increasing restrictions on footage reuse. Fair use apparently just doesn't matter anymore. The fact that I wasn't interested in racing until after this era was effectively over, so I don't have any of my own photos. And one has to be surprisingly careful when searching things related to Daytona prototypes if you're using any sort of abbreviations. I uh, <laughs> learned my lesson after trying to find comparison photos between the Riley Mark 11 DP and Mark 20. Um, yeah. So just think of this as a quasi-podcast. Um, I'll do my best to sprinkle in images that I can source appropriately and effectively, but on with the video. Podcast. Coming out of the relative boom years of the 90s, the world of sports car racing was, as usual, at a bit of a crossroads, split between predominantly European-focused events and a rebirth of American racing, although with healthier cooperation than had been seen for some time, as Don Panos's American Le Mans series was bringing the likes of Audi and Porsche's top-class Le Mans prototypes to this side of the Atlantic at races like Petit Le Mans and the 12 Hours of Sebring. On the American side of things, we had the Grand American Road Racing Association, or GARA, also born in 1999 from the mind of NASCAR's Bill France Jr. and the sports racing prototype class, vehicles derived from LMPs to run at a bevy of North American races like the 24 Hours of Daytona and 6 Hours of the Glen. The key differences between these two organizations that led to the re-divergence are, as is so often the way of these things, tied rather significantly to money and safety. Despite the GARA series starting out using the same class rule sets as the FIA and ACO used for Le Mans, and thus the ALMS, the sports racing prototypes that provided the series' top class were not ideally suited to the high banks of the Daytona circuit, which was the marquee event for the Grand Am Rolex sports car series, as it was called at the time. They were expensive to run, particularly for the primarily privateer teams that competed in the race and series, and many of them were facing superannuation by the mid-2000s. While the factory squads in the ALMS and on the other side of the Atlantic were running programs that easily reached into the low to mid-eight-figure ranges, Audi was reportedly spending north of $100 million on the R8 program to run five cars in 2003 on both sides of the Atlantic, and by the time the diesel hybrids came around, this had allegedly ballooned up to the very unfriendly side of the nine-figure range. Uh, budgets of that size were, well, frankly preposterous for teams that were running without the support of a manufacturer or particularly enthusiastic billionaire. Coupled with a generally more subdued economic sentiment in the U.S. following 9-11 and the rapid implosion of Enron and WorldCom shortly thereafter, well, suffice it to say there wasn't an extensive queue of the hyper-rich interested in appending erstwhile to the billionaire line on their business cards. And thus, in order to keep American sports car racing alive and build a uniquely American identity for the sport, a new prototype class was in order optimized for the exigencies of American tracks and spectators. Given these factors, the wish list for the new class was relatively straightforward. Lower costs and higher safety than the outgoing Le Mans prototype-based SRPs. The result from this wish list was, I would argue, one of the most comprehensive sets of regulations for a safe and cost-controlled series without a blanket price cap, as those have a tendency to create as many negative externalities as they prevent. On the cost savings front, the level of technology was substantially reduced from the LMP cars. All new vehicles were required to use a tube frame chassis rather than custom carbon tubs, and acceptable bodywork dimensions and aero were strictly defined to minimize a car's intra-season development through changes and the deployment of new aero packages or tweaks honed through expensive wind tunnel sessions or other experimentation. Engines had to be production-based from an approved list of manufacturers and specific engines, with the blocks required to have commonality with a road-going vehicle, 
while the chassis could be sourced from one of seven approved manufacturers, again, all helping reduce costs, but at the same time rather stifling the possibility of unique and creative solutions to engineering problems that come from series with more laissez-faire rule sets. From everything I've read, there were no restrictions on which engines could go in which chassis, so outside of any engineering impossibilities with power plant dimensions, and even those were pretty unlikely, it was essentially a pick-and-mix series in which teams could choose whichever flavor of chassis and engine they liked best and go racing that season. In fact, that's quite often what happened. The rule set also established limits on key engineering metrics. For reference, I'm primarily going off of the up to 2013 and then 2014 onward specs because those were the easiest to find. There have been some additional changes earlier in the class history, which I've, I've tried to address uh, as we go through each year, with most limits existing in duality based on engine displacement. For instance, all cars were limited to 500 horsepower, but those with engines displacing less than 4 liters could run at 2,225 pounds or 1,001 kilos of dry weight, while those of 4 liters displacement or greater had an additional 50 pounds or 22 kags added to their minimum weight. Cars with engines below 4.5 liters could run a 6-speed transmission, while those above 4.5 liters were only allowed 5 forward gears until 2014, but fuel capacity was 24 gallons or 91 liters across the board, interestingly enough. This actually makes the displacement limits quite curious from a strategy perspective, because the absolute maximum was 5.5 liters for naturally aspirated engines, 3.5 for anything with turbocharging, but I did find a source that said that Diesels were reportedly permitted as well, at least by 2014, at a tiny 2.5 liter engine capacity, which to me says that, in a happy little hypothetical here, uh, one could have submitted a modified Volkswagen Gruppe diesel 3 liter V6 power plant, fettled with by the boffins over at Audi down to 2.5 liters, turbocharged, and making obviously substantially more horsepower than the road going companion engine. And with 24 gallons of fuel to play with, uh, which is, for reference, 50% more than the contemporaneous non-hybrid R18, for instance, our ODP, pointless wordplay, but I am going with it, could have canoodled merrily along for ages between pit stops, possibly almost two hours if one got a bit lucky with drafting and perhaps a short safety car period, and would have presented a possibly very interesting alternate means of making one speed while still holding to the DP class rule set. But I digress rather substantially. Anyway, some of these restrictions also ensured that the new prototypes would not be nearly as quick as the outgoing LMP-based machinery, ensuring less risk in the event of a crash on the high banks of Daytona. For the first generation of DP, we had seven manufacturers approved to build chassis for the new Zoom machines. All of them were, of course, closed cockpits. The Chase CCE, the Crawford DP03, the Doran JE4, the Fabcar FDSC-03, the Multimatic MDP1, the Piccio DP2, which I think is probably the best looking of the vehicles, and the Riley Mark 11. For our heart donors, we had options from BMW, Ford, Infiniti, Toyota slash Lexus, Porsche, General Motors, uh, initially just under the Pontiac brand, and Honda, not a bad showing overall, with the smallest engines 3.5 liter offerings from Ford and Honda, while the largest were the GM 5.5 liter V8s, with, as mentioned, the engine usually offered as a Pontiac, but rebadged available for those with strong brand loyalty to either Chevrolet or Cadillac, should one so want, although I don't believe anybody actually took them up on this offer until after the Pontiac brand was folded in 2010. Later engines were also added, most notably a Porsche 5-liter V8 derived from the Cayenne's power plant, and a smaller 5-liter GM engine from 2005 or 2006, as there's some contradicting information on the internet about exactly when that GM engine came into play. Imagine that. On the safety front, the designs were noted and praised for their universal durability, particularly compared to contemporaneous Le Mans prototypes, which is perhaps again unsurprising given the more stock car inspired design. But comfort, on the other hand, was certainly more challenging than in the open topped LMPs and SRPs of yore. 
Safety regs had required that the radiator be placed at the front and all air leaving it to pass above the car, which, along with the dimension requirements, necessitated the rather shovel-nosed design. But this, coupled with the steel tube frame, aluminum floor, and engine being bolted directly to the frame, meant that cabin temperatures became high rather rapidly due to the high conductivity of all that metal. This was somewhat obviated with adjustable cabin inlets, but never fully resolved, even at a time when Corvette, in conjunction with Pratt & Miller, were already putting proper air conditioning in their GT1 and GTS cars. Nevertheless, at the outset, all of this work does seem to have paid off, certainly on the costs front. Car and Driver reported in 2003, a few months after the class's debut at Daytona that year, that the projected running costs for the Fabcar Porsche that Brumos kindly lent them for the day were as follows. Chassis, Fabcar FDSC-03. Man, they really didn't let the marketers get their hands on any of the names, did they? 330,000 US. Engine, Porsche 911 derived 3.6 liter flat six, 75,000 US, plus $25,000 rebuilds every 30 running hours. Transmission, MCO 6 speed sequential, 40,000, for a car total of 445,000 US. Full season's running costs, based on Gara's estimates, 750,000 US. Total per car, first season, $1.195 million. Still not the sort of money you find necessarily down the back of the sofa, but at least in my neck of the woods, but compared to the budgets for a full-season ALMS or ELMS run, God forbid tacking on a Le Mans campaign, $1.2 million for a full season of motorsport doesn't seem so bad. When you look at the schedules, that actually amortizes out to an average of just $100,000 a race, so assuming you don't wreck too frequently or too heavily, it's almost a bargain. He says, like he's got $100,000 to just throw around for a race every once in a while. Anyway, at the core of the rules, however, we can distill the initial elements of the class as such. Summarizing a few quotations from uh, Mark Rafauf, who helped mastermind the formula. We based it on the WSC style of car that we carried into Grand Am as the top class car. Essentially, flat bottom, low downforce, with a minimal amount of power. We figured out pretty early on that you didn't need more than 500 horsepower to go 200 miles an hour at Daytona. The whole idea was for them to have some diversification, but a lot of standardization, so a very specific chassis was described. We tried to use a lot of off-the-shelf componentry. Let each constructor choose how to skin it, what kind of engine to put in, and use production-derived engines, which was basically the lineage of WSC as well. With a more NASCAR style to it. It was roll cages, steel construction, which anybody can do well. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. And it all worked. For the class's debut, six new Daytona prototypes arrived to take the start of the 2003 24 hours of Daytona. Two fab car Porsches, entered by relative hometown heroes, Brumos Racing. Yes, technically, Brumos was Jacksonville-based for all of their existence, but it's pretty darn close, and I think they considered it to kind of be their home race. A Fabcar Toyota, a Picchio BMW, an Italian-Bavarian collaboration that definitely didn't look as good as the BMW M1 Pro car, but still looked a heck of a lot better than anything else on the, on the track, a Multimatic Ford, and a Doran Chevy, with a second Multimatic Ford anticipated, but neglecting to make an appearance. The race did not bode well for the class. All six cars were out-qualified by two GTS contenders, a C5R and a Mustang, and the now officially superannuated but kept around to flesh out the field, so here's some heavy restrictions like in Group C post Ecclestoning SRPs, also out-qualified the new DPs. The reason race footage shows the DPs starting from the front of the grid comes down, unsurprisingly, to a unilateral decision from the race organizer to, and I quote, save the first three rows of the grid for DPs, regardless of their qualifying times. American meritocracy, indeed. Matters grew grimmer still when, of the six entered DPs, three failed to finish, with the Doran Chevy the first to retire after only 67 laps, which is a less than two hours of running, uh, with an engine failure, 
followed by the Brumos number 58 engine, Segwa Sports Toyota Fire, and the Picchio BMW well down the order come the end of the race with only 451 laps completed, well behind the overall winners, a Porsche 911 GT3 RS from the racers group with 695 laps overall. The other two DPs fared better, but their pace was slow. And the Ford Multimatic squad finished fourth overall, five laps off the overall podium, and 18 ahead of the other Brumos car classified fifth. The next month, it goes without saying, saw some furious work to both improve reliability and straight-line speed for the cars before the next race, and things got better with DPs taking overall victory in the rest of the season's races, as one would rather expect from a prototype class in a field of mostly GTs, and the field did start to fill out, uh, with over a dozen cars competing by the season closer, also at Daytona. For the 2004 24-hour event, the improvements from a year prior were obvious. Lap times were down from 153 to about 148, with the best qualifying time coming from the Chip Ganassi squad at a 145.783. For reference, this year, 2024's, qualifying time for GTP, LMDH, whatever you want to call it, at the event was a 133.236 from Sebastian Bourdais in the number 01 Cadillac, also run by Chip Ganassi. Uh, Both reliability and field size were also improved, allowing the Grand Am organization to shut the door on the old SRPs. 17 Daytona prototypes took the start, 15 of them full season entries, with a relatively even split between all engine and chassis options. And the first retirement for a DP didn't come until lap 149 from the Team Seattle Ford Multimatic car. Ten other DPs did eventually retire before the clock ran down, but it was an improvement over the year prior in the sense that several of those 11 failed very late in the race, and a Pontiac Doran took the checkered flag for Bell Motorsports, driven by Andy Pilgrim, Terry Borcheller, Christian Fittipaldi, and Forrest Barber. Porsche GT3s did round out the overall podium in second and third, but a Lexus Doran was fourth and only five laps in overall arrears, followed by the most advanced of the DNFs, the Crawford Chevy, driven by a somewhat unlikely pairing of X Jag Group C, McLaren, Panos, and Bentley driver Andy Wallace, alongside Tony Stewart and Dale Earnhardt Jr., The Chip Ganassi racing duo of Scott Pruitt and Max Pappas would go on to win the Drivers' Championship and four of the 12 races that season in their Lexus-powered Riley, beating Wayne Taylor and Max Angelali's three victories in their Pontiac-powered Riley. Although the two duos dueled for much of the season at the front of the field and by the close of the season, DPs were consistently filling most of the top 10 tables. As we moved into the mid-decade, the class continued to grow, but not necessarily evolve. We did get standardized tires, everyone running on Hoosiers, but the big thing was that DP now saw a 29-strong entry list in 2005, and this puts us back into the realms of spreadsheets to track things. 20 of these were full-season entries on an expanded 14-round calendar, and Given the growing maturity of the class and the increase in field size, we can do some light data analysis. For the sake of timeliness, when I wrote this, it was still going to be like maybe a half an hour long video. We're at probably closer to an hour and a half. We're just going to look at the Daytona entrance year over year for a generally large, consistent sample size. As teams did occasionally change equipment mid-year, for instance, Segwa and Chase competitions started the 2005 season in a Fab Car Lexus and a Chase General Motors, respectively, but by mid-year, Chase was running a Lexus-powered Riley in some events, possibly due to a wreck or loss of what was an apparently unpopular chassis, uh, information scanty on an event-by-event basis, and Segwa had swapped to a BMW-powered Riley. Nevertheless, As we examine the chart, GM is by far the most popular engine provider at 12, with everything in 2005 branded as a Pontiac. Again, this would continue all the way through 2010. Lexus Toyota was next most popular, perhaps a bit surprisingly, followed by Ford. 
Porsche's tie with BMW is a bit misleading, as Brumos ran all three cars and, and thus reflects their financial state at least as much as their relative merits of the Porsche engine. Infinity had made it on the board for the first time, good on them, actually it might have been the last time, and as we split it up by chassis, the popularity of the Riley platform is quite evident, with the lion's share of both the Lexus and General Motors engined teams opting for their chassis. As with the Porsche's engine, their partnership with Fabcar tips the scales more heavily in that chassis's favor than it probably would otherwise, as perhaps does the Ford Multimatic partnership, which is one that actually continues to this day. Craftford, which I think is supposed to be Crawford, looks rather well, however, and Doran isn't doing too badly, just spread across a variety of engine providers. Actually, the Doran racing team was running two cars themselves, one with a GM engine and one with a Lexus power plant, so perhaps they were just keeping their options open. Other changes for the 05 24-hour race saw us down to only two classes, Daytona Prototype and GT. No further explanation of those two classes necessary, although if you want to learn all about GTs from the mid-90s to the mid-2010s, there's a DEF CON GT video on the channel that is an hour long that you can go watch after this. I use nuclear war as a means of explaining, or the lead up to nuclear war as a means of explaining all the different GT classes, which is a weird idea, but it worked. Uh, this year also saw, 2005, not 2024, also saw Paul Newman's last outing at Daytona after his car failed to finish the year prior. Unfortunately for the film legend, race veteran, and generally capital fellow, his drive with co-drivers Cristiano D'Amata, Sebastian Bourdais, and Mike Brockman in a Ford Crawford would be cut short after an accident 290 laps in. Though happily, nobody was harmed. The attrition rate for the race was not inconsiderable. Fully 25 of the 62 starters failed to take the finish, but the top eight were all DPs that year, led by the Wayne Taylor Max Angelelli car with additional co-driver Emanuele Collard. Having qualified in second, the Riley, along with a number of the other Riley prototypes, were quickest in the field, but the SunTrust liveried car avoided the bad luck of its 2004 outing, when it retired with a broken drive shaft, to finish well ahead of the Pontiac Crawfords that ran a slower but more reliable pace to finish the podium 11 laps behind Taylor's outfit. This year again saw the main duel for the championship play out between the Chip Ganassi squad and Wayne Taylor and Angelali, but this year Scott Pruitt was paired with Luis Diaz of Mexico. Both cars had two wins by the fourth race of the season, with the East Coast favoring Mr. Taylor's Pontiac and the worst uh, West Coast favoring Mr. Ganassi's Lexus, as they were both Riley chassis. After a mid-season largely dominated by the Howard Boss Motorsports' entries, wins for the Wayne and Max car at Barber, Watkins Glen, and Watkins Glen again, three events at the track on that calendar, clinched the championship for them despite poorer showings that the last two races of the season. For 2006, we saw Daytona entries grow slightly, uh, 30 DPs that year, and yet another track and event added at Sonoma Raceway. Uh, for marketing reasons, it was called the Infineon Raceway at that point, but Sonoma Raceway now, uh, bringing us to 15 events total. There were the beginnings, or perhaps more than the beginnings, of discussions about updates to the class as it continued to grow in popularity and the five-year design freeze loomed. Uh, there was also you know, the not inconsiderable desire to have cars that looked a bit less like turtles or modified refrigerator boxes, and more like the increasingly attractive and diverse Le Mans prototypes that were starting to show up across the big blue wet thing. But not quite yet do we arrive at that point of the story. For this season, oh good lord, the Rileys have grown. The Riley chassis reportedly heavily leveraged their World Sports Car Championship build, which was also wildly successful, and the data bears out that teams seem to have caught wind of this advantage. We still have four Lexus Rileys and four GM Crawfords, all Pontiacs, but we've added three more Pontiac Rileys and another BMW, while having lost Picchio, Multimatic, and Chase completely. Crawford seems to have taken up some of the slack, as has Doran, but it's difficult to say that anyone apart from Riley is really becoming the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Perhaps, 
Perhaps unexpectedly, our GM and Lexus Toyota contingents have stayed the same, with Ford picking up the most momentum year over year. Curious. For the big Daytona dance, as nobody has ever called it, or will ever again, I wager, the Alex Job Racing Crawford Porsche qualified on pole with Lucas Lure behind the wheel, sharing the car with Mike Rockefeller and Patrick Long, who weren't in the passenger seat, while the Lexus-powered Rileys made up much of the rest of the top qualifiers. In the end, despite difficulties with brakes and alternator belts early in the race, it was the number 02 Chip Ganassi's team to take top honors with a lap lead over Mike Shank's entry. Scott Dixon, Dan Weldon, and Casey Mears stood atop the podium to give Mr. Ganassi his first Daytona 24-hour win, but not his last. All the Porsches were quick, both Brumos and Joe entries, but struggled with reliability, lending second place instead to Mark Patterson, Oswaldo Negri, A.G. Almendinger, and Justin Wilson, while the aforementioned Crawford Porsche completed the podium. This season was less of a podium top swap shop between Wayne Taylor's SunTrust car and the number 01 Chip Ganassi machine of Scott Pruess and Luis Diaz, with the Alex Job car instead proving the more capable fly in the Ganassi ointment and the two trading blows and wins in the early part of the season. Crone Racing found their feet in the mid-season in another Riley GM and took wins at Watkins Glen, Daytona, and Barber while putting in enough podium and high-placed finishes during the rest of the season to see Jörg Bergmeister beat out Scott Pruitt and Luis Diaz for Drivers' Championship honors by a rather narrow 16 points, with no team's championship yet in the series. Mr. Taylor's car did take a win at Laguna Seca, and Mike Shanks's team did the same in the season closer at Miller Motorsports Park, but this year it was something of an underdog story after a rather poor initial few seasons for Porsche and Crawford both to at least finally get some race wins under their belt. 2007 was our last season with the Gen 1 Daytona prototypes, with the only change, possibly in preparation for Gen 2, being a move to a universal stock ECU to help standardize engine performance, and the calendar, too, stayed consistent at 15 races. Season opener prototype entries dropped, but just by two, down to 28, and the overall entry list was a bumper crop of 72 cars, so nothing particularly concerning or exciting in that sense. From a chassis and engine split, uh, Porsches shot right back up there after the Alex Job squad proved that there was value in the engine, jumping from four to nine in a single year, and apparently primarily stealing Ford's customers, as they've dropped away precipitously while Lexus remained level and BMW and General Motors saw smaller drops. The biggest change, however, is the mass migration of pretty much everyone to Riley chassis, except for those running Porsche engines. Uh, Crawford clearly received a second win from the last season, but interestingly, Brumos have given up the fab car experiment and migrated to Riley as well. The old Brumos fab cars seem to have been sold on to the smaller squads, and Doran is just hanging on with their own single Ford-powered entry. It's a bit of a shame Brumos swapping to Riley from the fab car because... Again, while one isn't spoilt for choice on the aesthetics front, especially not after losing Picchio, I did kind of like the look of the fab car design, especially in the Brumos livery. The Daytona 24-hour race that year had a few notable curiosities take place, including a pole position by the son of once and future president Dan Gurney, a dreadful wreck by Chris Pallas that caused only the third red flagging of the race's history, Catherine Legg allegedly completing the one millionth lap of the Daytona 24 hours, which must have been a hell of a calculation that someone made, and hence why I say allegedly. It's not to detract from her achievement itself, but I just find myself doubting that there wasn't at least a lap or two miscounted somewhere in the early days of the race. And Juan Pablo Montoya became depending on how one likes to count these things, either the first or second person to win a modified, some might say contrived, American-focused version of the Triple Crown of Motorsports, with this one being any Formula One race, the Indy 500, the Champ Car title, and a Daytona headliner, so it would be a quadruple crown, after Mario Andretti, but the first to win a Daytona 24-hour race, as the 72 event won by Andretti was run for only six hours because of a gas crisis. Aren't semantics fun? 
Anyway, that year's winners were indeed Scott Pruitt, which of course means the number 01 Chip Ganassi car, this time paired with a Pan-American squad of Salvador Duran from Mexico and good old Juan Pablo Montoya from Colombia. In a down-to-the-wire duel with Samax Racing's Patrick Carpenter, it's either Patrick Carpenter or Charpentier, I'm not sure I know there's typos in this script. The Wayne Taylor SunTrust car, that year bolstered by Jeff Gordon and Jan Magnussen, in addition to Angelali, completed the podium two laps in arrears. Gurney's car finished, but well down the order after a collision with a slower GT about a third of the way into the event. But he did go on to win the next event on the calendar with John Fogarty. Not John Fogarty of Creedence Clearwater Revival, sadly, and, well, pretty much everything else in the damn season. After a short drought following that first win at Hermanos Rodriguez, and a GT-only race at Lime Rock Park, the duo won six of the remaining nine events in the season to share the Drivers' Championship by a hair's breadth of two points over Scott Pruitt, whose win at the Daytona race had given him a huge lead over the two after their 22nd place finish. In the Constructors' Championship, because we have that now, or we may have had it beforehand, nobody bothered to post the score somewhere that was easily accessible, surprise of surprises, it was Riley again. Their fourth in a row, and a remarkable result for a car that apparently almost never made it to track. In the 2003 season, Riley struggled to sell even a single chassis of their new Mark 11, while almost everyone else got down to business. Despite having a car design that was based on the eminently successful Riley and Scott Mark III WSC, the 2003 season came and went without any team placing an order. It is worth noting that they had just come off of the Cadillac North Star program that didn't really go anywhere, so that may have been a bit of a weighing factor, but still. It was early September of 2003 before Chip Ganassi Racing and Wayne Taylor both just about simultaneously got in touch to place orders for the 2004 season, which reportedly not only saved the model, but almost the company, reinvigorating their fortunes and meaning that they had a path to future successes. Wayne Taylor also brought company president Bill Riley on to run his race team, and he returned the favor with the team and chassis' first victory at Phoenix early in the 2004 season. This, coupled with a few other stellar performances from the Ganassi squad and other privateers who came into the Riley fold, provided the proof to the pudding, and sales, as we've seen, took off and provided room for further expansion, leading to a collaboration with Dodge on the rebooted Viper, or at least the racing version, co-development of new LMP2s with Multimatic, and a host of other projects since. Moving back to 2008, we saw the introduction of a new generation of DP, cleverly called Gen 2. While Gen 1 cars were not immediately disallowed, and indeed some stuck around for quite a while, those Gen 1 chassis design slots that were no longer in use or heading towards extinction were essentially put up for sale, with Lola taking over Multimatic's slot, Delara coming in to purchase-slash-joint-venture Dorans, and Cheever partnering with Picchio to purchase the fab car slot under the Coyote brand name. There was some slight liberalization in the bodywork regulations to improve aero and nominally draw greater parallels to road cars and engine manufacturer brand identities, but it was still very much of a stock car-inspired setup, with most branding efforts limited to strategically placed decals that resembled road car grills, styling cues, or hood ornaments. You got a little bit of flexibility with the headlamps, but that was a bit of a reach, and you did get some aero relaxation, mostly focused on the roof line, rear wing, and front dive planes. Riley's efforts, perhaps the most important given their prior success, centered around improving the aerodynamics of their prototype, focused on changing front nose angles and modifications to the greenhouse, and coming in the form of the Mark 20, though many teams preferred to continue running the older Mark 9 bodywork, particularly at Daytona. Costs per chassis had increased slightly, with Andrea Tosso, the designer of the DP-01, noting that costs were, I quote, 450,000 US, not including gearbox or loom, which is wiring loom, presumably, but what about the engine? Uh, and total revenue, including spares for a car of about 2 million, with a break-even point for the company of about 18 cars. The durability of cars, in some senses, was almost their downfall as you apparently had some teams running the same transmission year in and year out without so much as a minor breakdown, leaving 
the spare they'd originally bought to gather dust on its original pallet. And if a manufacturer can't continue to make money on spares or a new chassis, well, that can be economically daunting to new constructors. Nevertheless, the newly approved for 2008 chassis were updated Crawford and Riley models, with all the other original manufacturers either rebranding, entering new joint ventures, or gone entirely, giving us instead the aforementioned Coyote CC-08 and Delara DP-01s, along with the Proto Auto Lola B08-70 and the Saber RD-1, which is certainly the coolest name of the lot, although again, not spoiled for choice. Delara appears to have taken more of a leaf from Lola's styling book, at least around the air intake slash tow box area with that sort of beaver tooth fascia. And frankly, when I was initially looking at pictures, I thought that was the Lola as a result. Still not winning any beauty awards, make no mistake, but the Gen 2 rules were really an iterative change rather than a revolutionary one, so this isn't particularly surprising. We did have a few rule changes going into the season, namely a new expectation that all drivers must have at least 30 minutes racing to earn driver's championship points. There was the introduction of a split safety car procedure with prototypes pitting on the first lap and GTs on the second, and a swap to Pirelli tires from Hoosier. For the 2008 Daytona 24-hour race, we again see a slight drop-off in DP entries, 25 in total, a new Porsche engine debut with the Brumos and Alex Job teams. Well, I say new, it's a slightly larger 3.99-liter flat six rather than the 3.6-liter power plant they'd been using thus far, but newish. Uh, but many of the chassis were still the older models. While Riley remains the dominant force, it was also with all Mark 11 chassis, and we do see a few folks taking a risk with the new Coyote and Lola designs, as well as somebody dusting off a Chase chassis from the year prior, all of them running Pontiac GM engines. Everyone else is pretty much just hanging on relative to the year prior, as economic factors really are starting to weigh a bit. Although Mike Shank Racing had swapped from Lexus to Ford, which is about the only particularly notable defection in the ranks. Despite a strong qualifying show for the Daytona race from two Ford Rileys, rain and frequent deployments of the safety car turned the race into more of a strategy game than the past few editions. But nevertheless, it was again the Chip Ganassi team who stood atop the podium for a three-peat with two laps in hand over the prior season driver's champions, with Scott Pruitt joined by Memo Rojas, Dario Franchitti, and Juan Pablo Montoya atop the podium. Scott Pruitt and Memo Rojas were indeed the class of the field that season, and while the Alex Gurney-John Fogarty pair had redeemed themselves at Daytona and placed second overall, they were unable to repeat their successes of the 07 season, posting only one victory and four more podiums, while Pruitt and Rojas put in five more wins and two additional podiums to clinch the Drivers' Championship. But the back half of the season was more of a mixed bag for winners, though unsurprisingly, most of them were in Riley's. 2009 is where we really start to see the face of the championship change, in large part due to the significant economic downturn that came in the prior year. The schedule is back to 12 races, down from 15, and Daytona saw only 19 prototype entries and 30 GTs, a net drop of 17 cars from the prior year. Porsche had come in with the aforementioned Cayenne-derived V8, sort of, although Spirit of Daytona were the only ones to adopt it for the race, with all the other Porsches remaining on the enlarged 911 power plant. Riley is the only chassis manufacturer supporting multiple engines at this point, with Doran giving up the Ghost and swapping to a Delara chassis to continue their campaign, although, again, this may have been more of a joint venture between the two, be that as it may, Chip Ganassi remains our only Lexus loyalist, and now Ford, General Motors, and Porsche are all on parity with five engines in the race that year. Penske had expanded their partnership with Porsche after the success of the RS Spider program in the ALMS, now running a Porsche Riley in the season, although there, there's a line missing here. But out of nowhere, we've got Wayne Taylor's SunTrust Racing shaking things up with a swap to a Ford Delara blend, which is weird. We'll deal with that later. I think fundamentally this speaks more overarchingly to the shift towards higher levels of professionalism amongst the remaining teams 
with some shifting down to only one chassis where previously they ran two, like Gainsco and other less successful teams dropping out entirely, at which point one's focus shifts more towards driver quality and setup rather than the decreasing gaps of merit between chassis or engines, with the closeness of these gaps helped substantially by the prescriptiveness of the regulations. For the race, both of the crone racing Ford Lolas, now in their second season, were out before the 12-hour mark with engine issues. We had a record 25 safety car or caution periods, despite largely better weather than the year previous, and a more exciting record set for the closest win after a razor-sharp battle between Brumos and Chip Ganassi to the finish, brought on by the Brumos team's loss of three laps after Antonio Garcia hit a tire wall. Juan Pablo Montoya drove the final stint for the Chip Ganassi car, shared again with Scott Pruitt and Memo Rojas, and despite setting a better pace on the infield portion during the final stint than the Brumos car he was chasing, he couldn't make a pass stick, and they took the checkered flag side by side with a .167 second margin of victory going to the Riley Porsche, breaking Chip Ganassi Racing's three-year win streak and giving David Donahue a win 40 years after his father Mark had stood atop the same podium racing a Lola T70 Mark III-B for Mr. Penske, which was actually mentioned in the Porsche 908 video, come to think of it. Ah, connections. Mr. Donahue the Younger shared victory for Brumos with Darren Law, Buddy Rice, and the aforementioned Antonio Garcia in the team's first series win since 2003. The rest of the season was not quite as favorable to the team, with Gurney and Fogarty back on form and trading blows, perhaps unsurprisingly, with Scott Pruitt and Memo Rojas again. But the new Wayne Taylor partnership proved successful enough to give Angelali and co-driver Brian Frizzell wins at a summer Daytona race and in Montreal. But Brumos managed a final win to close out and bookend the season at Homestead, while Gurney and Fogarty again won the Drivers' Championship, six points ahead of Pruitt Rojas. Riley swept the Constructors' Championship, never lower than third on the podium, and Ford the engine manufacturers, ahead of Porsche and Pontiac, separated by a single point for second and third overall. It's worth noting that we also have, I misspoke earlier in the video, our first appearance of Chevy power plants about mid-year, and had they been lumped under a single General Motors brand, it may have been sufficient to give them second in the championship, although I'm not 100% clear on how low-scoring points were factored in at this juncture. Someone much more pedantic than I am will probably explain in the comments, although I might have to say something that's actively wrong rather than admitting that I don't know to trigger that particular type of internet person. Points are assigned by Ouija board. For 2010, anyone getting tired yet? I sure am. The transition to the new chassis was essentially completed at this point. Although there were a few Riley Mark 11s kicking around, I keep typoing this as Mark 9s, particularly at Meyershank Racing. Chip Ganassi had also given up on Lexus at this point, swapping to BMW's 5-liter V8, and General Motors had killed off, or was in the process of killing off, the Pontiac brand, such that only two prototypes showed up that year with General Motors engines, both of them now badged as Chevrolets. Our economic boat anchor continued to drag on racing, and only 15 Daytona prototypes showed up for the event. Given that, we're going to move away from the graphs again, but suffice it to say that Ford was now tied with BMW for the greatest number of entries at five each, with the remaining three all Porsches. Brumos had scaled back to one entry for the year, and Penske was gone after their flash-in-the-pan season, focused back on IndyCar after Porsche withdrew their support for the team. Max Angelali finally qualified on pole after years of second bests, still driving for Wayne Taylor's SunTrust team, with whom he shared the car that year, along with Pedro Lamy and Ricky Taylor. Uh, not sure where Jordan was yet, I think perhaps just a bit too young still. But the weather gods did not deign to cooperate for race day, bringing rain and much lower temperatures than had been anticipated, which led to the race starting under the safety car for several laps, and bringing a rather large number of DNFs from an already diminished field. The Wayne Taylor car dropped to the back of the pack with transmission issues just before the halfway mark and managed to fight back to sixth overall, but it was the debutante Action Express team that came home to the win after setting a moderate pace in qualifying and the early stages of the race in their Porsche Riley. 
Wholly uncritically for the championship, but worth a mention, this car was powered by the Porsche V8 derived from the Cayenne, not the 911's power plant, and as it had been built by a third party without Porsche's support, the race organizers deemed it ineligible for points towards the engine manufacturer's championship. Nevertheless, it was a victory for a Stuttgart-designed power plant in, well, some ways, and it gave Joao Barbosa, Ryan Dial, and Mike Rockefeller their first overall wins at the event, along with Terry Porcheller's second. Rocky also became the first driver in 22 years to win Le Mans and Daytona in the same year, setting a distance record at La Sarthe that stands to this day. For the rest of the season, actually before that, I'm going to point out why I'm splitting these seasons so dramatically. Pretty much every event on the calendar except the Daytona race is short, almost dinky by comparison, with pretty much everything running either 250 miles or 2 hours and 45 minutes, apart from the Salem 6 hours of the Glen if it was sponsored by Salins at that point. Anyway, and as such, both didn't count anywhere near as much towards championship points, and as we've seen, usually had one or two front-running teams that traded the wins for much of the rest of the season. Speaking of, in our third or fourth season now of the Scott and Memo show, they gave us a performance worthy of Bruce and Denny, taking second at the 24 and three triple wins thereafter, so nine total, split only by a mid-pack finish at Lime Rock Park and a second in New Jersey, won by Angel Alley and Ricky Taylor and Gurney Fogarty, respectively. Given that, it was another pretty easy championship for the Chip Ganassi Chaps. Another banner for Riley with 11 wins and a second place, and an almost equally fine showing for BMW, courtesy entirely of Scott Pruitt and Memo Rojas. Moving into 2011, we see a swap from Pirelli to Continental Tires, a move which I wholeheartedly support, a slight uptick in the number of prototype entries to the Daytona 24-hour, 18 up from 15, <laughs> it looks like people were putting some of that stimulus package money to good use finally, and both Spirit of Daytona and Wayne Taylor SunTrust going to Chevy power plants, Spirit of Daytona moving from Porsche, and of course, SunTrust back from their brief dalliance with Ford. Mike Schenk had three ducks in the pond that year, one partnered with United Autosports in continuing the use of the Ford Riley car, one partnered with Curb Agajanian, with whom I believe he has more consistently continued to date, running a Ford Delara, and one by himself, also in a Ford Riley. The weather was pleasant to start the race weekend, with Jörg Bergmeister qualifying the Flying Lizard Porsche Riley on pole with a 1 minute 40.099, their debut entry in the class after running GT for many years. For comparison purposes, the 2004 qualifying time was 1 minute 45.783, and the 03 time was 1 minute 50.512, so moderate but steady progress. Angel Alley again qualified second for the SunTrust team. The race itself was a relatively clean one, apart from a period of heavy fog in the early morning hours that necessitated a three-hour long safety car until it cleared, but there were no major crashes, and the race was essentially decided in the final pit stop, with the number 01 Chip Ganassi car first out amongst the four leaders, all on the same lap, and cruising home to a close win over their sister car, Action Express, and United Autosports in fourth. This kicked off another great season for Scott Pruitt and Memo Rojas, who shared the Daytona victory with Joey Hand and Graham Rahal, the latter of whom also commemorated the 30th anniversary of his father's victory in 1981, while Pruitt and Rojas had a strong start to the season and finished nearly as well, but far from, at the same time, their dominant performance the year prior, with the back two-thirds of the season seeing more second-place finishes than anything else. Angel Alley and Ricky Taylor put in some strong mid-season performances to take second behind Pruitt and Rojas, while a mixed bag of finishes for Fogarty and Gurney meant that despite two wins, they only finished fourth in the Drivers' Championship. The continued success of the Ganassi team meant that, yet again, Riley took home their championship, but the combined SunTrust and Gainsco results in the back half meant that Chevy-badged General Motors power plants tied BMW for the Engine Manufacturers' Championship ahead of Ford and Porsche. For 2012, we got our third generation of Daytona prototypes, with only one actually new chassis submitted. Riley, naturally, came up with this Mark 26, while all other Gen 2 chassis could be updated to Gen 3 specs. But the big announcement was Chevy going all-in with a new Corvette bodywork design for the class. While I do cover it more closely in the Wednesday video that I posted, both cars took advantage of a further relaxation in the rules to run more typically prototype-looking bodywork, the new Chevy design taking things to an entirely other and excellent level thanks to Jim France's entreaties to Mark Kent, 
head of GM's racing division, with the 1980s Corvette GTP used as a reference point. The new design also came with a wink and a nod to prospective customers to support Coyote's chassis, which seems a bit odd on the face of it given their rather underwhelming performances up to this point, until one realizes that Pratt & Miller, General Motors' partner in the Corvette GT programs, had also worked on the Coyote Gen 2 chassis as a subcontractor, and that Riley, as Riley and Scott had, as I previously mentioned, been partners on the Cadillac North Star LMP. So a bit more understandable on the loyalties front in the background. Although, again, that's not to say that the Cadillac LMP was the worst prototype in the world. It's just, it wasn't an R8. And not having four rings on the front of your car made things pretty hard going at Le Mans in the early 2000s. Anyway, back in 2012, Corvette was the only manufacturer who really put effort into designing custom bodywork for Chevrolet engined cars, despite an open request and invitation from Grand Am to the other manufacturers to develop their own designs to take advantage of the relaxation in the DP Gen 3 rules. And they went through substantial efforts to collaborate with Riley and Delara to ensure that their bodywork would fit their chassis as well as the Coyote. Lola, Saber, and Crawford were pretty much by the wayside at this point, and by all reports, not involved. All the non-Corvette badged cars thus ran either with older DP Gen 2 bodywork or mild variations of the Riley stock bodywork that year and indeed for the rest of the class. That isn't to say there wasn't room for flexibility. Reduced body cross-section minimums freed up space at the front for greater design expression, getting rid of kind of the shovel nose. Side pods and vents could be added in new places, while underneath the basic chassis architecture, suspension setup which I forget if I mentioned in this video, double wishbones and push rods, coil springs over dampers on all four wheels, brakes, typically Brembo source units with steel rotors, gearbox, etc. had all stayed effectively the same since 2003. You'd think that given almost 10 years of this kind of consistency, manufacturers could at least commit to giving us something nice to look at, but no oh well. The new Gen 3 regulations were more readily and rapidly adopted than Gen 2, in part driven by an even smaller 14-strong entry list for the Gen 3 debut at Daytona that January, but I like to think that the great leap forward in aesthetic appeal had something to do with it too. Sort of the looks fast is fast policy as it were. 2012 was also the 50th anniversary of the race, so there may have been some pressure from on high to get everyone on the adoption ladder more quickly. Either way, for the season opener and Generations debut, effectively two-thirds of the field were new Generation 3 body styles, with four Coyote Corvettes, two BMW Rileys, both Ganassi run, two Ford Rileys, and our Carmbo Breaker in a Gainsco Riley Corvette. I believe this was actually the only Riley Corvette ever built, although I could be missing something. There were four G2 chassis still running, a Ford Riley each for Meyershank Racing, Mike Shank Racing, and Starworks, presumably because they either didn't have the funds immediately available, or Riley was at capacity to upgrade all of their cars to the new spec. Doron was still trucking along with their Ford Delara, and Crone in their Ford Lola. But wait, I hear you cry, with wailing eyes and gnashing elbows. Thirteen cars. You said there were fourteen entries. Quite so. Uh, there was one car, a BMW Riley, that was by all reports a late-year Gen 1 car, a Riley Mark 11. In keeping with the vintage theme, here's a picture of it from last year's Sebring Historics, and four of the five drivers were also over 50, Byron DeFore, Elliot Forbes Robinson, Jim Pace, and ACDC's Brian Johnson, with their fifth teammate, a comparative youngster, Carlos de Casada, at either 43 or 44 years of age. Which actually, if you think about it, that adds up to a collective age greater than that of the United States, for anyone keeping score at home, but be that as it may. The Ford Rileys were the best of the new cars by virtue of superior straight-line speed, showing this early in qualifying. Ryan Dial, qualifying for Starworks, put his Ford Riley Mark 26 on pole with a lap time of 141.119, slightly slower than the previous year's effort by Flying Lizard's Porsche Riley, and they would remain at the front of the field for all of a close-fought race between the new Mark 26s that saw the new design fill three of the top four places on the charts, with Mike Shank's curb Agajanian car coming home first, followed by Starworks and the Gen 2 MSR car on the same lap, and the better placed of the Chip Ganassi Gen 3 cars, one lap behind in fourth. Action Express was best of the rest in their Coyote Corvette, three laps adrift of the podium, and settling for fifth overall. 
The winning quartet was that of A.G. Allmendinger, that's still a heck of a name, A.J. Allmendinger, heck of a name, Oswaldo Negri Jr., John Pugh, and Justin Wilson, besting what can only be called a bit of a stacked deck lineup from Starworks, featuring ALMS vets Ryan Dial and Lucas Lur, multi Le Mans winner Alan McNish, and Venezuelan drivers Alex Popov and Enzo Potalicchio. Some, shall we say, close racing between McNish and Almendinger in the final hour of the race decided in favor of the MSR car after an earlier minor accident lost the Starworks car time and dropped them back into the clutches of the MSR team. Although the Starworks team did carry the honor of both most laps led and quickest race lap, the latter by more than half a second over the race winners. After Daytona, though, things started to go more Corvette's way, with Action Express, Spirit of Daytona, and SunTrust all taking home a couple of victories throughout the season. But, as usual, Pruitt and Rojas were in the mix as well, and though they only took two wins across the whole season, consistent racing and a half-dozen additional podium finishes earned them yet another shared driver's championship ahead of Ryan Dial. With 2013 came the final season of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. NASCAR had already purchased IMSA and Don Painaz's former motorsports-related properties, and the 2014 convergence between the ALMS and the Rolex series had been announced in the fall of 2012, which must have cast a bit of a pallor over the season, even if it didn't mean the class was fully going away. This year, it was the BMW Rileys who led a 17-strong entry list in qualifying, 16 of which were Gen 3 chassis, with only BTE Motorsports persisting with a Gen 2 Ford Riley, presumably purchased on the second-hand market. And they were out only after one half of the race or so, so well, what's it really matter? We had 11 Gen 3 Riley chassis, including one apparently licensed built by Delara for Doran, if I'm understanding this correctly, and five Coyote Corvettes, while Gainsgo persisted in their Corvette Riley hybridization program, the Mad Lads. It's worth noting, in a correction to my Wednesday video, that the LS9-derived Corvette V8 was apparently still a 5-liter unit until the convergence, at which point displacement and redline were both increased to get that extra 100 horsepower, so post-video correction made there. Nevertheless, the two Chip Ganassi cars qualified in number order, 01 and 02, less than a tenth of a second apart, while the Team Salen BMW Riley was in third, just ahead of MSR's fastest Ford Riley and the number 90 Spirit of Daytona slash Visit Florida sponsored Coyote Corvette. At the same time, the other Team Salen car was all the way down at the bottom of the DP qualifying table, so a bit of a mixed bag on their end. But, yet again, it was a dominant performance, if not a walkover, for the Ganassi squad, as the Wayne Taylor Racing Team was able to mount a more substantial challenge than their qualifying pace would have suggested. Despite a last-minute splash and dash from the number 01, and from the number 24 WeatherTech Audi that led GT, interestingly enough, and just losing the lead, the number 10 Wayne Taylor car had to box as well one lap later, granting the win to the Chip Ganassi squad yet again. Riley's ninth straight win, Scott Pruitt's fifth, not straight, matching Hurley Haywood's record, and Ganassi's fifth as well, making his victory record at the track 5 out of 10, which is a pretty damn good batting average. Wayne Taylor Racing came home to a close and well-fought second place, while MSR finished third and on the same lap of the podium. For the rest of the season, as with the year previous, the Corvette engine vehicles proved better suited for the twistier tracks than the Riley's. Although Rojas and Pruitt managed a win at Road Atlanta and Starworks picked up two wins in the latter parts of the season, the number, w the number 10 WTR car, driven by Angelali and now Jordan Taylor, there's a joke in there somewhere about three tailors and an Italian, but I'm a bit brain fried to figure it out right now. Anyway, they closed out the final Grand Am season with wins at Barber, Detroit, Kansas, Laguna Seca, and Lime Rock Park, with Action Express adding two more wins to the Coyote Trophy Cabinet, putting the Wayne Taylor Racing Chaps atop the Drivers Championship ahead of Pruitt and Rojas. Chevy well ahead of BMW and Ford for engines, but Riley taking advantage of a win by the Gainesco Riley Corvette and a string of second places late in the season to take the championship for chassis constructors. Then came Convergence. 
With convergence came the most fundamental change in the look and timbre of the Daytona prototype class. While the last decade had been typified by extremely close racing between cars that were largely kept on a tight leash as far as relative performance, the new United Sports Car Championship threw that perfectly balanced system into disarray. With a newly combined prototype class comprised of the Grand Am DPs and the ALMS LMP2s, as there were no more LMP1s for us, once again you had cars with very different ways of making their lap times, and the DPs had to be uprated to stay theoretically competitive. Most notably, power allowance was increased to approximately 600 horsepower, leading both the Ford Rileys and Corvettes to change their power plants in some way. Corvette went with the eternal axiom of there being no replacement for displacement, turning the LS9 up to 11, or at least half of it, 5.5 liters, of pure freedom thrumming along at up to 7,500 RPM. The Ford-powered Rileys went another route, swapping their 5-liter V8s for an EcoBoost 3.5-liter turbocharged V6, which sounds disappointing until you notice that it's largely the same zoom unit used in the Ford GT GTE and was delimited capable of at least 650 horsepower and about 550 pound-feet of torque. Meanwhile, the BMW teams don't appear to have done much. More of the ALMS rules were carried over for the actual conduct of the races, but that's enough info to make an entire video in itself, so we'll try to wrap this up fairly quickly. We've got about 20 minutes to go. Continental remained the tire provider for the prototype class, and the schedule combined what can be considered the best of both series, and much of what we still see on the schedule to this day. Kicking off with the 36 hours of Florida in the Daytona 24 and Sebring 12 hours, the 6 hours of the Glen, the Battle on the Bricks, Lone Star Le Mans, which is now a WEC thing, but nevertheless, and the season closer at Petit Le Mans. Additionally, aero changes were allowed, and expected, with DPs adopting a larger and more aggressive diffuser and rear tunnel, and a dual element rear wing, both increasing downforce and seen here. Brakes, clutch, and suspension component choices were liberalized, two whole brands of shock absorber, wow, with the costs of upgrading a car to the new spec estimated at somewhere in the $600,000 range. This was, interestingly, about the same or slightly higher cost to a brand new LMP2, with whom the DPs were expected to compete, which, yikes. Data loggers were mandatory for all cars. Those choosing to swap to carbon brakes had additional ballast added, 25 pounds, and there were no longer limits on the number of different gear sets and ratios that a team could run, where previously it had been three. As another factual tidbit that seems to have been forgotten, in the lead-up to the launch of the new combined series, my anticipation was such that even Audi expressed interest in becoming an engine supplier for the DP Gen 3 cars with one of their petrol engines, rather than going through the trouble of developing an LMP2. But, of course, as we know in hindsight, nothing came of this, as with their more recent interest in rejoining the World Endurance Championship in Hypercar. Instead, they're going to Formula One, because pageantry. We just can't have nice things. The first reason's results, that is to say 2014's, displayed a clear advantage to the XDPs, with the same teams, Action Express, Wayne Taylor Racing, Chip Ganassi, and a brief mid-season comet of excellence from the number 90 Spirit of Daytona, pretty much dominating the top steps of the podium and the championship, particularly the Corvettes. The best result for a Chevy engine was never worse than third throughout the year, with those coming at Sebring and Circuit of the Americas, quite possibly due to the heat. That year's Daytona race was red flagged due to what can only be called an absolutely dreadful crash when Memo Gidley, not Memo Rojas, driving the Gainsco Riley Corvette, plowed into the back of the Risi Competizione Ferrari at 120 miles an hour on the infield after the latter car had lost power and slowed in that section. Both Gidley and, and Matteo Malicelli in the Ferrari were hospitalized for several days in critical condition, and while I'm not sure whether Malicelli ever made it back to the track, happily Memo Gidley did recover from a broken back, leg, and arm injuries to come back to Daytona and IMSA Racing in 2022 in an LMP3, which qualifies him as a grade-A badass in my book. 
Corvettes, nevertheless, went 1, 2, 3, 4 at the Trioval, led by Action Express from Wayne Taylor Racing, while Ganassi won at Sebring to give the Dearborn Mark their first win at the bumps since 1969, and while Wayne Taylor Racing won the first Petit Le Mans in which DPs were eligible to compete. 2015 was the beginning of the end for our now remarkably long-lived Daytona prototypes. Though the schedule was largely unchanged, just lost the indie round, the entries at Daytona and Sebring rather belie the full-season participation. After Daytona, we lost Starworks, RG, and one of the Chip Ganassi cars from the DP side, while after Sebring, both of the Tequila Patron Acura cars dropped, which, in fairness, the ARX-04B was not great, Bob, and never to be seen again after Daytona, they ran the 03s at Sebring, as did Crohn's Ligier and the 50-plus BMW Riley. Thus, with most of the XLMP2 competition gone, it was again the DPs that ran rampant, particularly the Coyote Corvettes. Um, I don't believe the Gainesco Riley was ever rebuilt after the Daytona incident, uh, although Ganassi's Fords managed two wins in the season, one at Daytona, which begs the question, where is Mr. Ganassi putting all these Rolexes? Surely after three, you can't wear them on your wrists. And one at Austin, with Joao Barbosa and Christian Fittipaldi, your 2015 United Sports Car Champions, Action Express, your team champions, and of course, Chevy, your manufacturer champs, with a nearly unbroken string of wins after Daytona. 2015 also brought the announcement of DP's end, with an as-yet-unnamed replacement class introduced on July 2nd for a debut in 2017. Based on LMP2 chassis, and without the mix-and-match flexibility of the Daytona prototype class, these cars would require manufacturer-constructor partnerships, and thus factory teams would again be allowed. This would become Daytona Prototype International, intended to further convergence and allow American teams to again race on both sides of the Atlantic, and particularly at Le Mans. Which, okay, yeah, we ended up having to wait until 2023 and LMDH4, but an effort was made, although it did spell the end for a 13-year period of relative affordability and certainly close racing. Let's finish with 2016. The 2016 season came in with a shiny new name, the IMSA Sports Car Championship, but no other major changes. Still 12 races, still four classes. There were only 15 prototype entrants on the ledger that year, of which only eight were intending to race the full season. Tequila Patron and 50 Plus both had extended schedules planned to contest the longer races for the Endurance Cup, but pretty much everyone else was just there for Daytona and or Sebring, including both Ganassi cars for the first time, as their focus had shifted to the new Ford GT program. And so, in this greatly diminished year, success was certainly more difficult for the DPs than in years past. Balance of performance, that heavy-handed dread fairy of puts and takes, came in and fettled with everyone's performance to some extent, and qualifying at Daytona that year was, well, essentially useless. Rain plagued the first three sessions, and our old friend the Delta Wing, now in its diminished coupe form, led the field for the fourth and only dry session, putting in a respectable 138.59, which is actually not far off the 2014 quality time of the ill-fated Gainsco car. The starting order was rearranged again so that the cars were gridded in class order, and the Patron Acura and one of the MSR Ligiers were quick away into first and second, followed by the Delta Wing. Without making this too much of a Delta Wing video, uh, Catherine Legg would make it into the lead of the race before night fell, thus becoming the first woman to lead the 24 hours of Daytona outright, as well as her previous achievements as the official completer of its millionth lap. I think they should give her a special trophy. But the car unfortunately retired after Andy Merrick failed to notice local yellows and hit the back of the Starworks prototype, ending yet another race early for the ill-fated innovation machine. The grind continued for the other prototypes as well, with the Corvette DPs and Tequila Patron Ligier Hondas trading the lead through the morning. But the race saw 21 total caution periods, most of them due to collisions or mechanical failures, and in the final hour it was Pippo Durrani who swept past Jordan Taylor, apparently wasn't feeling well, in his Ligier to take the checkered flag, despite a failure in his... Honda Ligier's power steering system and an overheating transmission. It was the first victory for Honda, Ligier, and Pepo Durrani, who shared the car with Scott Sharp, Ed Brown, and Johannes von Overbeek. Might have been their first victories, too. I didn't bother to actually do that research. I'm sorry. Second went to the Wayne Taylor team, with both Taylor's sons sharing the car with Angelali, Natch, and Rubens Barrichello. 
They were the best placed of the Corvette DPs, but Visit Florida and Action Express did come third and fourth in theirs, with the podium cars all on the lead lap. The best of the Ganassi cars, sadly for the team, was 11 laps in arrears to take fifth overall, despite a stellar driver lineup of Lance Stroll, Alexander Wurtz, Brendan Hartley, and Andy Priel, while the other Action Express car finished in sixth behind them. Sebring saw great promise for the Vets, with Action Express topping every practice session, but pipped for pole position by both MSR and Pipbo Durrani, intent on a back-to-back -back win to kick off his foreshortened season. This time, there was no rearrangement of the classes required based on qualifying time, and all the prototypes qualified well ahead of the GTs. The weather, too, seemed to favor the XDPs with their wider tires than the LMP2s, with a few showers giving way to heavier rain and eventually a red flag that neutralized the race for more than two hours. Even after the race resumed, intermittent showers made this race, too, a strategy one, and after the wet weather gods pulled the Wayne Taylor Racing Corvette down to a watery electrical grave with less than three hours to go, the race again came down to the wire with an epic last-minute drive by Pippo Durrani to move from fourth to first on the final laps, passing the Dragon Speed Orica 05 and both Action Express Corvettes to take victory by less than three seconds, while third and fourth were determined by less than a second each. Alas, the Delta Wing retired yet again, mere moments from what could have been its finest result, but again, that's a story for another time. After these results, the Tequila Patron cars, as mentioned, retired from the overall championship, apart from Watkins Glen and Petit Le Mans, so the Endurance Championship, and this allowed Wayne Taylor Racing and Action Express a bit of breathing room, with the two teams taking wins across the board, apart from an MSR victory at Laguna Seca. The last official race for the cars came at Road Atlanta, and from the start, the Michael Shank racing with curb Agajanian cars seemed pretty much unbeatable on pace. They topped all four practice sessions, Ali Plop with the Ligier JSP2 on pole position, and from the start of the race took off from the rest of the field. It was only at the first pit stop that things started to get tense for the team, as issues with the drive pins on the left rear meant that they would lose time in every pit stop when they tried to change that tire and they dropped from the lead and lead lap in this first stop, a problem exacerbated upon resumption by a middling pace from John Pugh. This promoted the Action Express cars to the lead, followed by the two Mazda LMP2s and the Visit Florida car, but a misfire dropped the number 90 car from contention early and sent it into an early retirement for the first of the DPs. MSR realized their only material hope to make up time was to keep Pla in the car as much as possible, and did so, with him retaking the lead by the third hour. Another driver swapped to Oswaldo Negri, dropped the car back down the order, but not critically, and he made his way back to the lead by hour six, leading the number five Action Express car to hand back over to Ali Pla. The number five then effectively dropped from contention due to a puncture, seeing the Corvette standard now borne by only the number 31 Action Express and number 10 Wayne Taylor cars. But alas for their swan song, it was not to be. Despite late contact from Jörg Bergmeister and continued issues with the rear wheel, not only did Ali Pla set a lap record, but he took MSR home to a final victory. Corvette almost missed out on any podium steps, as Pippo Durrani was on yet another charge, and may well have made it past Pla to win a season bookender, with a Mazda prototype in third. But a fire with only 11 laps to go meant that the number 70 Mazda was DNF, and the best of the Corvettes, the Wayne Taylor racing car, finished 12 seconds behind the two Ligier P2 cars, followed closely by the number 31 Action Express machine, and more distantly by the number 5, two laps behind after their puncture. And so ended what can really only be called a remarkably successful period for American sports car racing, if not its most romantic or beloved by fans. To have a class that worked and produced consistently close racing with little modification year over year, or huge budget arms races that price out any but the wealthiest manufacturers, is an undeniably commendable achievement. So what went wrong near the end? Ultimately, and this is just my opinion, although we'll bring in some supporting quotes from others at the end, convergence was unavoidable, but it also killed the class. The careful balancing that was required to create the sort of long-term stability that we enjoyed was inherently incompatible with, for lack of a better word or phrase, the collision of two very different racing cultures, both in terms of how the cars were designed, but also how the racing itself was done. I have nothing specifically against one or the other. I generally prefer the more technical side of 
racing, that's why I enjoy multi-class, mixed with some of the theatrics, although not to the level of stultifying pageantry that Formula One has become. But the history of the world abounds with examples, natural, physical, and sociological, that fundamentally prove coexistence is never long-lived. But, of course, as the industrial period's second-worst economist reminds us, in the long run we are all dead, so before we trend into any sort of socio-political theses, I'll close this bit with some selected quotes, edited slightly to preserve context, as brevity long ago went the way of the dodo, uh, some selected quotes about the end of the series from those who made the Daytona prototypes what they were. And then we'll have a cheery end note and our usual final remarks. From Mr. Rafalf. The hardest thing was to balance. To be successful was all down to tuning the car and the guy driving it, which was the whole idea in the first place. The costs to operate a DP changed significantly after the convergence. Upgrading the Gen 3 DPs to keep pace with the faster P2s was an expensive process, and with many of those performance items being consumed at a higher rate and more time spent on track with the blended schedule, a championship-caliber DP entry moved north of the $4 million mark so the formula said goodbye to its cost-friendly ways in 2014. And from Mr. Wayne Taylor. The unfortunate part about DP is that it just became too expensive. It's just the nature of the sport. We have Daytona, Sebring, Petit Le Mans, but the costs involved for those races, you get it to the end of the season and your car is pretty worn out. And then you have to rebuild it, and build it again, at least for us with DPs. Adding all of those long races came at a heavy price. But take heart, comrades, for though the DPs, be they Gen 1, 2, or 3, may no longer compete for points in IMSA competition, as with so many of these videos, I get to remind you that these cars were sold mostly to private individuals to enjoy a comparatively quiet retirement. But echoing these sentiments of Ferdinand Porsche, few things are sadder than a shiny race car kept shut away in a garage or museum showroom. And let's be honest, most of the Gen 1s and 2s aren't going to inspire a new generation whilst they're sitting there on a plinth. So, thankfully, there are plenty of well-heeled folks that take their superannuated machines out for exercise a few times a year at vintage events around the country. So if this rather meandering missive has made you wistful and wishful for the days when NASCAR designed a sports car class, it's quite possible that your nostalgia hit is closer than you think. Check the HSR event entry lists, or your local SCCA chapter, or if you have particularly deep pockets, keep an eye out for one to come up for sale. Gen 1 DPs, though not common on the market, aren't terrifically expensive all the same. For instance, there will be at least one Corvette DP, the number 09 car seen here, at Road Atlanta Fall Historics later this month, and like as not, a fair few more at the Daytona Classic 24 and Sebring Historics later this year. And hey, I'll be there too. Well, that brings us to the end of a longer video than I expected it to be. Uh, actually, I can use the classic car talk ending. You've wasted another perfectly good hour and a half listening to Lensler. Uh, kudos to any and all of you who stuck through it till the end, I'll buy y'all a beer at some point. For this week's call to action not featuring the three sacred words of YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. I feel like I should close with something more profound and salient than many of my closings, given how long this damn video turned out. And so I'll finish with this quote from the inimitable Richard Feynman that certainly describes my approach to the entire study of sports cars and motorsports that creating this channel has kicked off, but arguably one of the tenets of my more overarching personal philosophy. Study hard what interests you the most, in the most undisciplined, irreverent, and original manner possible. On that note, as always, but even more than usual this evening, thank you for your time, whenever and wherever you are watching, and I wish you all good night and a good tomorrow.